This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. Do me a quick favor. If you like what you hear at Planet Microcap, please take two seconds and give us five stars on Spotify or Apple. This helps with the search engine so that more folks can also discover and engage with all things microcap stocks. The Planet Microcap Showcase Vegas is happening April 30 through May 2nd, 2024 at the Paris Hotel and Casino. We just announced our first keynote and speaker, which is Andrew Walker, host of the Yet Another Value podcast. Uh, he will be back to host a keynote Q&A with legendary small and microcap investor Bob Rabati. This is a conversation you will want to see in person. Our event brings together the best investors and thought leaders in microcap, quality microcap investing opportunities, and above all else, the most fun and highest return on your time that you could ask for. There's more announcements to come but registration is open. So if you'd like to register to join us and participate, please visit planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. Now, my guest on the show today is Lionel, editor of the Valorum Research Newsletter. Uh, I think Lionel, and he likes to stay anonymous here, uh, might be one of my favorite podcast guests. His appearances on Andrew Walker's Yet Another Value podcast have uh, caused me to question all of my life choices and perhaps reevaluate, maybe even getting a law degree, if only so I could totally understand everything he talks about. Uh, and all jokes aside, uh, in our conversation today, Lionel and I talk about how and why he finds legal special situations so interesting as well as high-level overviews of recent cases he discusses in way more depth on Andrew's show and his overall take on antitrust, M&A, and his thoughts on the topic for 2024. Thank you again for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my interview with Lionel, editor of the Valorum Research Newsletter. Lionel, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing, man? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Look, I'm I was I'm so stoked for the opportunity because you know I, I obviously you know not only do I listen to all of Andrew's pods, but you know we help out behind the scenes there, and so you know I, I truly feel that after the last I mean you've been on this pod now two, twice in the last two weeks, I feel like I could probably pass the bar in like at least twenty five out of the fifty states at this point. So you know I appreciate you coming on and uh, you know us taking a you know a thirty thousand foot look at you know everything that you got going on there. Hey, look, man, I appreciate you saying it. And and that is exactly the goal, right? The goal is to uh, equip people with, with the tools of the law to be able to, you know, look at these cases, break down the legalese, make it decipherable, make it digestible, and uh, hopefully provide some people a little bit of value. Absolutely. A lot of bit of value, in my humble opinion. You know, so let's, let's take a step back. You know, again, for those that may not have ever you know, obviously the newsletter is relatively new, but you've been around for a while. You've been doing, you've been in the game and, and doing podcasting and covering a, a number of these uh, special situation legal cases. Um, but for those that don't know you, your background, you know, this is a, an anonymous interview here, you know, so uh, go under the pseudonym Lionel Hutz, you know, as Andrew likes to say, uh, uh, X or Twitter's uh, favorite cartoon lawyer. <laughs> so give us a little background, you know, I, I, where'd you get your start? And how'd you get to where you're at today? Yeah, I, uh, let's see, starting before law school, I was an engineer. Uh, so when I when I went to law school, I focused very heavily on intellectual property, uh, mostly, you know, kind of high tech patent law type stuff. I uh, started out my career in law at, you know, one of the major firms doing uh, mostly patent and, and trade secret litigation, uh, litigated uh, a number of those cases. It was a pretty, pretty packed uh, schedule for, for a few years. Uh, and uh, then ultimately left to switch over to the technology transaction side to get some reps on M&A deals uh, because I, I kind of knew uh, when I was litigating that ultimately I wanted to do something with legal special situation investing. And I knew that M&A was a, you know, a necessary large component of building up that, that skill set to be able to do that. So I uh, went to another large firm, uh, got some reps on M&A deals, 
uh, before ultimately leaving to pursue uh, investing largely full time. I do some you know consulting work on the side, but uh, you know this is this is kind of it for me. This is this is what I like to do. It's what I hope to continue to do moving forward. Uh, and so I, I focus largely on uh, you know patent disputes, uh, other technology disputes, as well as merger arb, which kind of includes antitrust. Although I am not an antitrust attorney by by trade. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I touch on a few other things as well. Uh, obviously, you know, we can talk about things like Burford and, you know, kind of international enforcement, which, which are not necessarily kind of in the core of what I did, but are, but are still, you know, really, really cool plays that, uh, you know, if you're willing to put in the work, you can kind of wrap your head around and figure out what's going on. hundred percent real quick, you know, compliance, Bob here, Burford, you shareholder. I am. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. All right. So, you know, one of my favorite episodes that we ever did on Planet Microcap was with Meredith Brill um, at Lockstock Barrel on Twitter or X. And the reason that it was one of my favorites is she has a very similar background as patent, patent lawyer. And she and, and a couple of her colleagues, including Jason Hirschman, you know, they were they made their career in Expel where they were like, all right, we want to see if there really is, you know, because the 3M had the the infringement. Case. I don't know if you remember that one, but um, I do, yeah. You remember, OK, so you remember that case. And so the reason I bring all this up is because, again, that was one of my favorite podcasts of all time. And there's so much that can be uncovered if you just dig in the weeds, you know, with everything that's publicly available. Of course, and you're just doing that next level deep dive due diligence that, you know, some will do, some won't. You know, so was that some of your perspective when you're like, hey, I can apply so much of these skills to all of these various situations out there that, you know, might just either be mispriced, overlooked or just let left for dead because it's just too much work. Yeah. I mean, it, there are so many reasons why I find this stuff interesting. I think, you know, before I even went to law school, um, I was, I was really interested in what Kyle Bass was doing with inter partes reviews. So, you know, I, I don't think this strategy ever really made a lot of money if, if any for him, but I, I found it fascinating where he was uh, finding patents, largely pharmaceutical patents listed in the orange book that, you know, really, really should be invalidated. He would, you know, find the company for whom it was critical, short the stock, you know, initiate an IPR and and try and capture that that delta. Uh, I found that to be fascinating. And and that was a large reason why I wanted to go to law school in the first place. I kind of went to law school never thinking that I would be a, a practicing lawyer for my entire career. Uh, I, I went to law school because I think it's a really cool uh, toolkit to have. It's a, it's a cool skill set to be able to use. Um, and so, you know, I, I love investigating this stuff. Um, you know, I think, uh, particularly in the pharma space, uh, you know, it's, it's a really cool, the patent law, uh, skill set is a really cool skill set to have because patents are so critical to the success of, of drug developers. Uh, you know, that's obviously just one area that I, that I focus on, but it's, it's a really, really interesting niche. Uh, and, and a niche where, you know, I, I think the market just doesn't really understand this stuff. You know, Liquidia just hit yesterday. Uh, there was a big ruling uh, compliance. You know, I, I am a Liquidia shareholder. I like the company. I like what they're doing. Uh, but when I talked to, you know, sell side analysts, when I talked to uh, analysts at hedge funds, you know, nobody really knows how to underwrite a patent litigation matter. Uh, and, you know, being able to, actually go through a docket and figure out what matters and, and you know, be able to uh, underwrite that process is something that um, I think, you know, not a lot of people are doing. And, and I just, I love doing it. I think it's, it's fascinating. Well, why not? I mean, I mean, the obvious answer is, you know, okay, it's a lot of work, right? You know, how do we decide what's more important? What's not, you know, I don't have the legal background, you know, but like, it's pretty a lot of these these firms have the resources where they could either just hire they have hire an in-house or you know outsource something you know so like why is it still left unattended or just not underwritten like you said yeah you know i, I don't know if i have a, a great answer as to why it's not done i mean certainly plenty of firms will uh you know reach out to attorneys and and try and get some some consulting uh, to, to better understand these matters. I think part of it is, is more on the kind of supply side than the demand side. I think, you know, attorneys who are able to do this stuff um, are, are largely making really good money at law firms and they simply won't 
uh, get too involved in a case for for ethics and conflicts purposes, right? They won't, uh, you know, break out of the bounds of, of their law firm to essentially take on risk. And I think most attorneys, you know, you ask them any question and the, the kind of classic joke is any response you're going to get is it depends. Attorneys are really scared <laughs> of, of putting any sort of probability. I mean, I, you know, we, we, yeah. we've talked on Andrew's podcast a lot about the, the spirit deal again, compliance. I, I am a spirit shareholder. Um, but, you know, I talk to attorneys that, that are passionate one way or the other. They, you know, they they think the DOJ is going to win. They think spirits going to win or, or jet blue is going to win whatever. And then you ask them, okay, well, what are your odds? And they say, uh, 51%. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, and that is, that is not the level of conviction that you just conveyed to me in the last, you know, 30 minutes of us talking. And so I think just having that, that willingness to, yeah. to put a number on something when you do have conviction, I mean, when, when the Twitter uh, deal was going on with, with Elon, uh, you know, I, I went out and I said, I think this is 98%. Uh, you know, I was like, you know, if, if, if this doesn't work out, and I think Andrew actually said it best. I don't know if it was on a podcast or, or, you know, in one of our text exchanges or something, but he was like, if this doesn't work out, like, I think the system's going to burn down. And I was like, man, I think that's right. Like that, that's one of those cases that's like so clear cut, um, that, that, you know, you, you have to be able to have that level of conviction. Uh, and, and I think just attorneys don't really do that. And so, you know, if you're a really large firm, you know, if, if you're, uh, uh, you know, twenty billion dollar, fifty billion dollar hedge fund. Maybe you can hire those attorneys in house, but but largely for the smaller smaller funds, it, I think it's hard to get um, kind of credible analysis given the uh, the the salaries that attorneys are making at law firms. Absolutely. All right. So this is probably the number one question I've been wanting to ask you, and not just listening to you know the pods that you did with Andrew, but also in reading your 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 newsletter. And it's it seems appropriate because, like as you said, you have your background in patent patent litigation, and you know, really in patent law. But you look at compelling or potentially compelling cases across the board. You know, international law, merger are patent infringement too, healthcare IP. You know, so for you, you know, what makes a potentially compelling legal play in the public markets. Let's start there. I'm sure we'll go down a thousand rabbit holes. Yeah, um, I guess I can, uh, you know, start out by talking about kind of the process of filtering because so many people come to me and say, "Hey, have you looked at this idea?" And and nine times out of ten, if not more, it's either too hard or too early. And and when I say too hard, I mean there are you know there's a multiplicity of factors that could make something too hard. It's you know it's a a court that I've never litigated in or have, have, you know, don't know anyone who's litigated in that court. It's a type of claim that I'm unfamiliar with. It's, you know, any number of things. But I think the the larger issue is uh, people come to me just way too early. They say, hey, what do you think about this case? And I say, I think the, I think the, the, the complaint got filed yesterday. Uh, I have no idea. Like, talk to me in a year and a half or two years or three years. Um, it, it's really hard to get any semblance of of security on a claim when you don't have access to the data room like you know i am very different than a burford capital right like you know the the ypf case aside and and my thesis on burford um you know what burford does as a litigation funder is they you know they get access to the inside information and they will fund a case at the outset because they have that that inside information that they're able to make a, a decision on. And they have a ton of attorneys in-house that are underwriting these these cases. Uh, for me and for, for the public markets, you know, you don't have the benefit of that inside information and you simply have to wait for a case to mature, uh, you know, maybe not to, you know, pre-trial, but maybe, you know, post you know, written discovery or, you know, you need to get some depositions on the record where you can, you know, maybe get past summary judgment where you kind of see what the the outline of, of really the, the ultimate arguments are going to be. You, you really have to wait until you have that information in your back pocket that you can rely on. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to what does, you know, what is a compelling case, it's, you know, having the ability to to analyze something. Right. I, I will step outside of my traditional expertise if I feel like I can break down, OK, what are the burdens on the parties? What evidence has been produced? You know, what what testimony is in the record? 
uh, do I understand the the legal claims that are being asserted, the the claims, the counterclaims? Uh, can I can I simply put odds on any of this stuff? Uh, you know, is it a case that has you know they're they're impleting third parties and there's a million claims and you know one side's alleging a thirty billion dollar loss and the other side's alleging a thirty five billion and like maybe it's going to be a wash or is it just a simple case of you know a breach of contract and and somebody thinks they're owed five hundred million dollars right like that that is I, I think simplicity is the key and you know you obviously have to make sure that whatever the legal matter is it's material to the market cap of the company you know. Merger arb can be any size, but but you know patent litigation, uh, breach of contract claims, you know those largely have to be small or micro cap companies uh, because ultimately the value of the claim needs to be material to to you know the the market cap that is is currently you know it being floated in the market right so uh, it, it's it's a a multitude of things. Uh, but but I would say first and foremost, you know, I just get so many so many questions about cases that are really early, and and I think patience is is really key. Got it. So I mean, you kind of you kind of got into my next question there because I wanted to take that even a step further. Of like, okay, clearly it's like okay, first step is all right. What makes a compelling case? Well, there's got to be some information about it, right? Like, you know, you're we're going off what's publicly available, so it's not you know you're not at you know one of these litigation for where you know all that kind of stuff. So. Taking that step further, once you've had all the information, you've already kind of touched on it a little bit in, in that answer. You know, what then are certain things that as you're getting that information, and I know there's a thousand different ways you can skin this cat as well, but what sorts of information that once it becomes publicly available, they're like, all right, I want to look further into this. This actually looks like this could be a really interesting case. Um, if it works out in this direction, you know, I want to find out a little bit more from here. Yeah, I don't know if there's there's ever like one thing that I look for that like puts it over the hurdle of, of what becomes a compelling case. Um, it's it's always a process, you know. I I will go through you know a, a million different you know phases of like, oh, I think this is compelling. I think it's let's, not. I think it is. So how about this? Let's use, let's use an example you've already talked about. So like um, liquid thing. Liquidity, great. Let's yeah. use liquidity. Like, what was it when that when all the information first became publicly available that you're like, all right. These are the things that were really interesting to me and why I wanted to explore further. Yeah. So I had a, a an early conversation uh, with one of the guys at, at Calligan, which is a, a fund that that has been involved in the, in the play. Uh, one of the partners at Calligan was on the board of Liquidia. And, and I had a call with him. It, the name came to my attention. I had a call with him uh, just to better understand what Liquidia was as a company. Uh, and, and he just kind of gave me the overview of the market and, you know, what, you know, uh, inhaled troprostanil was he, you know, he was, he was really generous with his time in, in just giving me kind of the lay of the land of, of pulmonary hypertension issues. Uh, and, and so that was kind of my, my first foray into the company. And, and I thought, okay, this, this seems like this is a really compelling company. They have a very clear strategy. Uh, they are in a really interesting market. Uh, you know, it took them a number of years to develop this product, uh, which means that yes, they're like technically a generic, but it's not really a market where like once the patents expire, you're going to see like a dozen generics enter this. Uh, you know, the the hygroscopicity of of uh, dry powder troprostanil is is such that uh, it's you know it's really hard for for new entrants just to like come on the scene tomorrow. Um, so I, I had this conversation and I was like, oh, this is a really cool product. I know they've got patent litigation going on, uh, but at the time, you know. It was still like district court litigation was going on, I think, and, and we didn't have a final ruling. You know, there wasn't a ton of clarity. You had concurrent inter partes reviews going on for for some of the patents, um, and and it just it seemed a little a little too early. So then December of of last year hits, and and Liquidia gets a that they had been ruled to infringe at the district court, and Liquidia gets a favorable ruling at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, which is the kind of mini court for, for the U.S. patent and trademark. Um, so I, at this point, you're like, well, the patent has been ruled invalid. I knew that all Liquidia needed was success at the federal circuit with this PTAP appeal. 
the the cards the you know the deck is is stacked in liquidius favor at this point because the burden the the ultimate burden is on united to to show that the ptab ruling was uh insufficient or, or or you know not based on sufficient evidence or or not legally sound uh and and you know the market was saying well liquidia was ruled to infringe at the district court these patents were ruled to be valid at the district court and therefore you know liquidia is not going to be able to, to market this product until 2027 when this 793 patent expires and you know, just procedurally, I knew that to be factually incorrect, right? I was seeing this come up in like sell side investors. They were saying like, liquidity, you know, yes, liquidity got this PTAB victory, but too bad, so sad, they they lost the district court. I'm going, that's not true. That's not how this works, right? Like if if the federal circuit affirms the, the PTAB or if they reverse the district court, liquidity wins and they will start commercializing. So that was when I was like, okay, not only is this an interesting play, uh, just, you know, I, I find the patent litigation interesting in, in and of itself, but the market seems to have this wholly wrong, right? Like people are relying on information that is factually incorrect. Uh, so then, you know, dug further into the actual decision, found that the final written decision that the PTAB issued was, you know, there were some errors in it. Uh, there was a, you know, United asked for the presidential opinion panel at the PTAB to, to rehear this thing. The presidential opinion panel said no and directed the PTAB to just kind of clean up their work. Um, and so that's when I was like, OK, not only do we have the market not understanding what is happening procedurally, uh, but you have this decision that has been sort of like convoluted by this like weird process that doesn't normally happen at the patent trial and appeal board. And I think people just don't understand this. And so I really dug in. I was like, all right, if 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 there's something here, there's going to be a huge gap, there's going to be a huge delta in what I can make on on a liquidia purchase. Um, and so, you know, ult got really familiar with the facts of the case, you know, dug through the docket, went through the IPR, went through the district court litigation, you know, thousands and thousands of pages and said, OK, I think liquidia has a very, very strong case. I think they got a terrible draw when it comes to the judges that adjudicated the, the decision at the patent trial and appeal board. But I thought they had a very strong case. And so that, you know, December of last year when I was, was when I was really like, there's something here. I'm going to put a, you know, a decent amount of money behind this play and, you know, we'll see it play out. There were a number of interstitial events in the meantime uh, that, that had the stock, you know, going up and down. But but the, the thesis for me was always the federal circuit is going to over or sorry, is going to affirm the PTAB uh, decision that invalidated the, the 793 patent. Holy shit. <laughs> that was a lot. I know, I know I threw a lot at you, but but it, you know listen, I'm it, not even I'm not even gonna pretend that I understood like eighty, even eighty-five percent of what you just said. <laughs> I will say I think that the kind of one sentence summary is like, you know, I, I was I was getting familiar with the company and getting really in the weeds of the docket mm. at the same time that I saw the the sell side notes were, were simply factually inaccurate. Right. And, and, and that okay. to me was like, OK, not only do I think Liquidia has a good chance of winning, I think there's a huge gap. In, you know, there's a huge inefficiency of, of information here. Uh, and if you have a little bit of a background in patent law and you're willing to spend the time, uh, you know, I think you can you can really take advantage of this. 100 percent. You know, one thing that I was thinking about when you're talking, when you're going through everything for liquidity, obviously, one was like questioning my own life choices and why I didn't go to law school. And secondly, I'm thinking to myself, you know, timing. Right. And from the time that you're like, all right, this is interesting to like, all right, I want to dig into a lot of work and then actually take a, you know, a meaningful position to and continue to affirm my thesis and whatnot. So how do you think about timing when you first are like, all right, this is something I really want to dig my teeth into, maybe even take a position versus, you know, I'd lo love to hear more there. Yeah, I, I've found and, you know, look, I'm still kind of building out my strategy and I'm learning every day. Uh, I have found that kind of six months to 18 months to ultimate decision is kind of the ideal window to get involved. Uh, if you if you assume that uh, a typical litigation and th that changes for for the type of, of legal matter, right? Uh, antitrust stuff is is expedited. It's usually faster. Uh, you know, it, when the DOJ or FTC files a complaint, it's usually like eight to twelve months until you get a, a final decision. Uh, but for things like patent infringement or or you know other you know federal district court litigation. 
uh, three years is is not atypical. Uh, there are certain dockets. The Eastern District of Virginia is what's called the rocket docket. You know, cases will be tried in, in 18 months or less. But uh, typically speaking, you're looking at like a three year window, sometimes five year if there are stays in the case. Uh, and so I try to, you know, filter out the chance of, of significant delay. I, uh, you know, I, I know that if if it's a patent matter, there's a chance that district court litigation gets stayed. If there's a concurrent IPR, there's, you know, all sorts of ways that things can get delayed. Um, and so I try to get involved, uh, you know, sometime between six months and, you know, a year and a half out from what I think will be the ultimate uh, decision. And I think that's usually when, you know, you can capture kind of the most upside with the the most certainty that you're going to get. So what, you know, you, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but I'd love to explore it even further. What falls into the too hard camp? Because, you know, look, I'm, 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 I'm an idiot here by any stretch of the matter when it comes to legal event driven special sets. So everything that you just went through liquidity, I'm like, that does, I mean, what's too hard for Lionel? I don't know. Like that sound, that all sounded pretty dang hard to me. You know, so what, what falls in the too hard camp for you? Well, I, I should first, you know, preface this all with like, I, I have looked into things and, and, you know, done research on things that, that I am not an expert in. And it is largely because I have a, a fantastic network of really smart attorneys that I can lean on, you know, they won't always tell me what they think about a case because they have their own obligations to their firm and ethical duties, right? Uh, but they will almost always tell me where to start researching. They will tell me, hey, you should check out this professor at Harvard or you should read this, uh, you know, case uh, textbook. Um, you know, there, there's always somebody who who is willing to kind of impart some level of expertise to get you going in the right direction. Um I think, you know, a lot of the things that are too hard are, as I said earlier, you know, just too, too nascent, too early in the case to, to really get involved. Um, I think administrative law in particular can be can be really hairy. Uh, so anytime you have, you know, federal agencies uh, involved in some claim outside of, you know, for me, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. But like if it's, you know, some other federal agency, uh, there are all sorts of you know, regulatory you know, rules that that are not found in your kind of typical, you know, case law textbook in, in law school. Um, so I, I generally stay away from from those unless I feel like I can get a really clear grasp uh, pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, you know, I, it, it really depends. I think, uh, you know, you, you just got to be patient. Uh, you can't rush these things. And, you know, I think if you're willing to put in the work and, and if you have people who, who know the area better than, than you do, uh, you know, relying on them and, and having them point you in the right direction is, is really instrumental to, to get over that hurdle and, and, and turn something that, you know, was too hard into something that is perhaps digestible. Absolutely. So, so another question I have for you is, you know, what, what would you say are some situations or some cases that maybe piqued your interest? did a little research, but then you ended up not digging into it further. And and what were maybe some of the factors that ultimately led you to be like, all right, I've seen enough. Next. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can tell you, I, I looked at one recently that was essentially a breach of contract claim uh, where the party alleging the breach um, had some, some, <laughs> difficulties internally they had some you know allegations of fraud they had all certain and so that that for me goes into kind of the the too hard as far as like uh potential jury psychology right like how you know yes of course the the party alleging the breach who who had these potential issues of fraud uh yes they're gonna you know file a, a motion in limine to exclude anything relating to that so that doesn't come up at trial but what if they're not successful or what if they just don't do it because they're not on the ball you know is if a jury finds out about this stuff what are they going to think uh you know the the image the, the optics of a case are often just as important as as the facts uh you know it's why again to go back to the jet blue spirit case right now it's like that that's really interesting because it's a bench trial and so you don't have to worry about uh, what does a jury think, and and you know you, you can really dig in on on the judge and and decide 
you know, does does the judge matter? What do I think this judge is going to think about this case? How is he going to handle the case? He's going to be more critical here than he would be in in a case where, you know, you've got uh, eight to 12 members of the public who are uh, sitting in and, you know, ultimately deciding the, the fate of the parties. That's one of my favorite parts of your interviews with Andrew is when you guys go into like the psychology of the judge. I'm just like, oh my gosh, like with this it's is important. like, I mean, look, when it's we were, like a law and order episode, you know? Yeah. I mean, when, when, when we were litigating cases back in the day, I mean, you know, we, we'd bring in a, a jury psychologist uh, who would, who would assist with the, the voir dire process, you know, the process of impaneling a jury. Uh, and, and these are top notch psychologists and they're, they're saying, you know, they're giving you, seriously broken down, you know, information on, on who they think, you know, what, what the demographic profile of the ideal juror is for, for your case. Um, and, you know, you get certain peremptory strikes and, and then you can challenge for cause and other, but like, it's really interesting, you know, you've, you've got a, a randomized pool that you're deciding from or that the judge is deciding from. And, and, you know, you're deciding, Oh, do we use a strike now? Do we not, you know, is this person going to be the, you know, the, the leader of the jury? Do we see them as a, as a independent thinker, a leader? Are they going to be influencing other people or are they a follower? I mean, it, it really is uh, a fascinating process to be a part of. Uh, it, you know, it's an area that I am not a psychologist by trade at all, uh, but I found it, I found it fascinating. And uh, it, it was, it was just really cool to be a part of that, you know, over and over again, as you're going from, from court to court across the country and seeing, you know, what are the kind of like archetypes of jurors that show up again and again? And, and how does that play a role in the ultimate decision? Very cool. Have there have there been any legal special situations in recent years that you have a little bit of FOMO about? They're like, oh, dang, I wish I dug into this one. Forever. Well, I, I wish I levered up Twitter more. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I, I know a couple of people that I think made life changing money on that. I certainly did not make life changing money, but you know, it was, it was good to me. Uh, I think, you know, when I was kind of first starting out, you know, developing, you know, I, I've been developing this strategy for, you know, only a couple of years now, really. Uh, and, and, you know, I've been trying to fine tune it. And, and like I said, learn in public a little bit. Uh, Ren Ren was was a case that I know a lot of people were involved in. That was that was a big one. There have been a couple other like uh, merger art plays recently uh, that that I have stayed away. Microsoft Activision I uh, was not involved in uh, simply because of the international element there. Uh, you know the the UK um, the what is it the Consumer Markets Authority or yeah. I'm, I'm probably yeah got who uh, Andrew had on for that one, but that was a good episode too. Oh, yeah, no, I think but, you're just talking. No, what am I saying? He talks about that with Chris every every uh, exactly. Yeah, and you know, I <laughs> look. I think that's one of those things where I just I am not. I'm I'm not a UK attorney. I'm not an EU attorney. Right? Like they they put in a lot of work to to ultimately understand that. And I think it was a level of you know I would have had no edge as compared to them. Right? Which is not to say that it's unlearnable or unknowable. Uh, but I like at least starting out from a point where I feel like I have some base level of understanding that kind of facilitates the rest of the process. Uh, and, and I just felt like I didn't have that there. Uh, and there was a, a tremendous amount of uncertainty. The UK and EU authorities are, you know, they have much broader mandates, much broader powers than, than the DOJ and FTC do in the US. Uh, and so to me, it just seemed like a very scary uh, you know, possibility of them simply saying no and that that being that. So uh, I think that's that's a good example of something that, you know, a uh, little bit of FOMO went into my too hard bucket. Uh, a lot of people who did put in the work, you know, did very well on it. And and certainly kudos to them because uh, I think it was it was difficult to hang on at, at times. Absolutely. So let's talk DOJ FTC too, because one of the things in the recent pod that you guys did was talking about like, all right, uh, listen, not every case is going to, you know, is going to be, uh, you're going to beat the government, you know, when a case is being brought against, but it's been seemingly that it, a lot of them have, right? And a lot of the, a lot of these mergers or acquisitions have just have been actually getting going through, you know, so what is the current state of the, I guess, the 
going through rate. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right term or something, anything like that, but you know, speak, okay. And speak to a little bit of what's going on in DOG FTC and like why folks maybe should be paying attention a little bit closer to, you know, if the rate of weight, if it's a higher rate of going through, if more acquisitions and more potential mergers that might not have in the past gone through might go through now in 2024 and further. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, it, it, the the administration plays a huge role in this, right? Uh, I know, you know, Andrew certainly has said, you know, he's taken the stance that he sees this as kind of like an inflection moment uh, in, in M&A because uh, even the, the conservative side of the aisle, where once they might have been totally free market, I think they're less favorable to, to tech these days. Uh, and so, you know, the, you don't have the kind of, partisan like republicans are free market democrats are not it, it, you know you you can get cases being brought from both sides of the aisle uh that being said i mean the the current state of the play with with jonathan Cantor at the doj and lena khan at the ftc is a lot of cases are, are being brought that probably shouldn't be brought uh but they are playing for uh it's almost like kind of like a war of attrition of like, you know, moving the, the, uh, you know, the, the DMZ, if you will, of, of antitrust law, like one inch forward and one inch back kind of a thing. Um, they, they have gotten a couple, you know, very small wins in the last uh, year and a half, two years, as far as expanding antitrust law into what they, what they call this Neo Brandeis, movement which is you know big is bad uh you know it's important to note that, that historically the hit rate for for the doj and ftc was really high they were they were winning like i think it was like 80 percent right. of cases maybe more um and and you know recently it's it's been just abysmal uh and the reason is you know they've they've been sort of trying new legal theories to support these cases um you know i I have my own opinions and, and, you know, views as to, you know, whether or not they should continue to do that. But I will say from a, from an investor standpoint, uh, you know, I, I kind of hope that they do continue to bring them simply because it creates investable opportunities. I don't think it's necessarily the right direction for antitrust law to go, uh, you know, in, in the aggregate, but, but certainly on individual investable opportunity level, uh, it, it creates a really interesting market. Absolutely. I was going to say, in, in my opinion, I was going to like, oh, come on, Lionel, do tell, you know, but I, you did. So I appreciate it. So, I mean, you know, look at, we're, we're recording this on, uh, what's it, Thursday? Yeah. Thursday, December 21st, 2023. We're at the end of the year here. You know, you want to reflect a little bit on, you know, the year that was in 2023 when it comes to some of these legal special situation cases, you know, how some of them played out and what this maybe will tell us about 2024. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, it's been an awesome year just as far as, you know, building up kind of, you know, I, I just released the the Valorum substack and, and uh, you know, it's, it's been awesome to kind of build a, a, a community of people that are interested in these legal special situation plays. Uh, you know, even if there's not direct lessons, you know, even if you're not going to get an exact Liquidia play or an exact Burford play in 2024, uh, just, you know, having a, a group of people that, that are interested in these things and are willing to learn about them, I think is, is, is awesome. And I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of it. Um, you know, I think the, the M&A trend is, um, you know, one that, that will certainly continue into 2024. Uh, you know, we just saw Hawaiian and Alaska, uh, you know, announce that, that they are intending to merge. I think that is, I uh, somewhat of a play on on the JetBlue Spirit deal, but it's also a potential play on a new administration. So you know we're kind of now in this this uh, dead zone, lame duck kind of period where where you might get a litigating FTC or litigating DOJ that is not the DOJ that or FTC that files the complaint. Uh, and so you may see settlements happen. You know if there is an administration change. Certainly, if there's not, I would expect things to continue. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, I think the, the, the election is going to be a, a really critical, uh, you know, kind of indicator of, of what the next four, four years uh, of, of antitrust law will look like. 
on the patent front, I mean, look, there's there's new patent matters all the time. The law is is continuously developing. Uh, you know, I don't think there's anything that happened this year that that you know really rocked the the patent world. Uh, but but you know, I think given the large pharma players are all facing these patent cliffs uh, and, and, you know, they're, you know, going to need to expand their portfolios. I think M&A in the pharma space is going to be a really interesting play. You're going to see a lot of patent disputes uh, as, as competitors try to edge one another out. Uh, and so I think it's just an, an exciting area to kind of keep an eye on both from the, the patent litigation standpoint and from the M&A standpoint. Very cool. All right. My final question for you here today, Lionel, is again, 2024, it's upon us. You know, you mentioned one case that might, you know, get further along in 2024. By the way, Hawaii and Alaska, do you have ownership in any of those, any side there? I, I don't. No. Yeah. I haven't, just just looking at it. Okay. Yeah. So, so what cases do you think in 2024 that are coming, coming up or that are coming up in 2024 that you might find interesting? Yeah, you know, I I guess I'll, uh, I'll I'll be a little cryptic because I there's a few that I'm considering writing about that are all in that you know coming up on that window, and so uh, I I don't have enough conviction yet, uh, but I've got a few uh, in the chamber that that are you know very nearly uh, you know very interesting plays, and uh, you know a couple trials that that'll likely be going to uh, kind of midway through 2024. So uh, I guess my, my answer is wait and see, hopefully, uh, you know, this stuff uh, plays out the way I think it might. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be releasing some, some articles for folks to read in the uh, very immediate future. That's the answer right there. Subscribe to the newsletter, right? So yeah, thank you. (laughs) Speaking of that, Lionel, we're there, man. Thank you for answering all my questions, dude. I really do. I'm sure we'll have you back on, not to do individual cases, because you, you and Andrew, you do that. I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> but like, but maybe ha- every, you know, half year we could do like an update on, you know, just a whole bunch of them and why they're interesting, what, how this reflects the current M and A market, so because that stuff's super interesting to me and our audience as well. So, for our, where can folks go and follow you on Twitter X or uh, also subscribe to your newsletter? Yeah, uh, you can go to Valorum Research. That is V-A-L-O-R-E-M research.com. Uh, feel free to, uh, to, to you know, like, subscribe, follow, reach out over DM, please. I love talking about this stuff. I love when people pose really thoughtful questions. And and when people have dug into the docket themselves, it means a ton to me that, that you know, people who follow this stuff end up investigating on their own and, and challenging me and, and asking me questions about specific, uh, you know, docket entries. Uh, I, I love that stuff. So please, please do, uh, you know, get in touch. Would, would love to continue the conversation. Very cool, man. Well, dude, happy holidays. Happy new year. Really do appreciate you taking the time here. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next update, man. Thank you so much. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast podcast.